Hello boys and girls, I'm back and I want to talk about guitar speakers one more time. But this time it will be a little different, because I have invited a guest. I have invited a real expert on guitar speakers. Not someone like me, you know, who talks a lot about guitar speakers, but someone who actually knows everything about guitar speakers. And he's one of the main people behind the legendary speaker company Jensen Speakers from Italy. And I have a lot of questions to ask him. And you have also sent me a lot of questions. So um, hopefully we will all learn a lot about guitar speakers today and will be enlightened by my dear friend Ignacio Vagnone. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. How are you? How is the situation in Italy? It's hard. It's difficult. We are um, under a heavy lockdown right now. Uh, we, we are barely allowed to move from home. Uh, yeah. However, the sun is shining. The food is always great. You have a beer. I have a coffee. Life is good. Happy days. <laughs> it's Friday evening, so it's it's beer o'clock in Germany already. Or why don't you start um, saying something about the Jensen company? Because I believe that even if Jensen is one of the the biggest guitar speaker companies. Uh, most people on this channel who are more into metal might not know that much about Jensen. Okay, sure. Well, let's start from the beginning. You are probably listening to this uh, web show uh, through a pair of maybe studio monitors or hi-fi speakers or uh, multimedia speakers or your headphones. All of them have dynamic drivers inside. And a dynamic driver like every guitar speaker, basically is, is, is built with a magnet, a voice coil, and a membrane. This concept has been invented in 1915 by Peter Jensen, wow. who was a Danish engineer uh, who moved to uh, the US. He, basically, he is the inventor of the dynamic uh, speaker as we know it. There's a bit of background. There's a bit of history behind, behind the Jensen brand. I don't want to go through everything, all the steps, you know. But however, let's say that um, Jensen was the main supplier to speakers for the industry um, starting from the 30s or 40s. So they were selling speakers for whatever, the newborn radio business, the, high, the newborn hi-fi business, uh, like public address, like speakers for hotels or restaurants or uh, uh, train stations. So when... The guitar market uh, exploded, the, the electric guitar market started, you know, they needed amplifiers. And Jensen was the go-to uh, supplier of the industry for almost every kind of speaker. So it's kind of natural that especially the very early manufacturers who were mostly based in the East Coast, like Valco, Supro, Silvertone, uh, those kind of guys, they went for Jensen because Jensen was based in Chicago. Uh, so Jensen started developing a little bit of a background, a little bit of technology in the guitar business. And when a certain guy named uh, Leo from Fullerton, California, started his own business, it was kind of a natural choice. Fender became not the sole supplier because uh, this was totally against Leo, Leo Fender's uh, concept. Uh, but we, we were... Jensen was probably the biggest and the best known uh, of the suppliers at the time. So we went, you know, all the tweed generation, the blonde generation, the brown, until uh, up to the blackface uh, generation. So let's say until 65, Jensen was Defender Sound for maybe 80% of, uh, of the models in the catalog. In 1965, uh, Leo decided to sell the company to CBS. CBS wasn't really interested in, uh, in, in keeping on the business with, with, with Jensen. So Jensen decided that, well, without Fender, we are not really interested in bringing on into the MI business, into the guitar business, okay. which in 1965 Stupid, right? was probably the biggest mis possible mistake to be done. You know, one year before uh, the Beano album, one year, two years before Hendrix, three years before Zeppelin, Cream, all the British, wow. ex 
you know, he was like... So, so, so Jensen completely pulled out of the guitar business yeah. at that time. They basically disappeared. For how long? Well, for 35 years almost. Okay. And, you know, and, and that's somehow one of the reasons why Celestion became the dominant force because we were the biggest competitor and we just pulled away. So Celestion, with all the hard rock uh, and heavy metal and new rock happening in England, you know, he, he, they they were fighting their own uh, their own battle on their own playground. So it was kind of natural. And then you came back. And then we came back uh, uh, in in um, in the late nineties. We were a group of people working for the distributor of the Jensen Consumer Audio Division. So we were selling like hi-fi, car radios, car speakers, that kind of stuff. But we, I'm, a, I'm a guitar player. My boss at the time was a guitar player. Mm -hmm. The vintage reissue thing was starting to happen. You know, Fender was selling the American Vintage Series. So we we kind of saw this this trend happening in the industry and we asked it to the Jensen management, would you allow us to try and rebuild this? And, you know, they looked at us. I was a kid. I, I was 26, 20, 25 years old. They looked at us and say, yeah, okay. They, they, they kind <laughs> of let us toy around, you know. We spent... Uh, a good two and a half years shopping around for vintage amps and speakers. Ah, because you didn't have any... We didn't have... No samples from the past. We didn't have... Not only we didn't have samples, but there was no technical background. So there was not an archive where you can you know, open a drawer and say, ah, okay, the P10R was made with this component by, and the, we were buying the membrane from this supplier. We, we had... Zero. We had to wow. start from a blank sheet of paper, which means which means heaven for a guitar player, which means shopping around for vintage amps and speakers <laughs> with basically money is no object. <laughs> That's nice. That's so a good that part of it. That was fun. That was fun. But but I guess that was a lot of trial and error, right? Or oh, until a, you a lot a lot of a lot of I, I will explain later, but we had to buy stuff and then we, we started learning. We had to destroy some of them, you know, opening yeah. them pull away the membrane, try to understand who was the supplier at the time, blah, blah. So it was a very long reverse engineering uh, process. But, you know, after a few, a few months, Fender opened it up as, as a supplier. And Mesa Boogie opened it up as, as a supplier. And Victoria Amps, and, and then others, you know. And only then we actually realized how far we went, you know, what kind of an achievement we actually had. We, we were nobody in the business. Nobody would believe us, but, you know, the, the product spoke for itself. So it, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. I have incredible memories of those days. And it's a great story, I have to say. Yeah, that. it's fun. Re reverse engineering, all that stuff, sounds, that sounds like a real adventure. Oh, yeah, it was. It was. But let's talk about let's talk about speakers in general because I got a lot of questions from people and oh, I also wow. have a lot of questions because the the interesting part is that you actually know a lot about speakers and we guys only play them. I mean, uh, we know how they sound and we might like them or not and I might be able to describe them, but to be honest, I don't know shit about speakers. I know oh, well. there's a I know there's a magnet, I know there's a voice coil, I know there's the membrane and which is made of paper. But uh, that's about it. But let's get started with a question. So okay. I'm gonna start with a few, I guess, simple question. Um, one question is from me and from someone who is called Bryce Reitz. Um, by the way, I asked the people on my email list to send me questions. So if you are okay. not on my email list yet, uh, you'll find a link below. Anyway, this guy, Bryce and me, um, we want to know one thing because what in my experience, especially with vintage 30 speakers, I feel like the 16 ohm version of the same speaker sounds brighter than the 8 ohm version. And... I don't know if that's true or if that's just coincidence. And I don't know if that's a Celestian thing. So if you have the same model with a different impedance, do they sound the same or not? They don't. Why? Actually, the higher 
the impedance is, the lighter the moving mass of the, uh, of the speaker is, because the voice coil is wound in a different way, so the voice coil is lighter, so being the voice coil and the membrane lighter, the speaker will be slightly more efficient and slightly clearer, slightly brighter. Because it is faster? Or? Uh, no, it's not that it moves faster. It's, it's, um, it's one of the many balances that happen in, into a speaker. The lighter the membrane, the more efficient is the speaker. So uh, it will be, we are talking about fraction of dBs, maybe one dB, and only in certain frequencies. Okay. But as a general rule, the higher the impedance, the brighter and the more efficient the speaker is. So the 16 will be the brighter, the 8 will be, let's say, in the middle, and if, if you have a 4-ohm version, that will be significantly darker and, and, and uh, quieter. That's interesting. And that's, ge ge that's general. That's a, ro a rule of physics. It happens for every brand, every maker, every model. But it's interesting because, because nobody, nobody's saying that, right? It's like, I've never read that. Not really. But, you know, if you dig a little bit carefully, you can find this kind of information. But, you know, it's easier to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Drinking, drinking beer and asking you is a lot better. So that was already the answer. Awesome. So next question um, is about speaker burn-in or break-in, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, so the question is, is this... I mean, people people talk about speakers like they compare them to leather boots. You know, you need to wear them for a while to make them feel comfortable. And uh, so the question is: Is that a real thing? Is that an urban legend or something? Uh, what about speaker breaking? Okay, and how and how important is it? Let's let's put it this way: it, it it's a two way thing. So, on one side, yes, uh, the speaker is made of. Some parts that are obviously they don't move. There's a magnet. There's a there's a basket. They 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 do not move. But the suspension, the membrane, the voice coil inside, and the back suspension, which is the yellow thing, the spider, the spider yeah. that 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 that's, that holds the 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 voice coil, they do move. And you know when you buy a speaker, they have been resting in their natural. Uh, position for maybe a few months so the first time you will you, you, you will give them current the, the paper will need some you know some time to get the elasticity that has been designed for so yes it's true speaker do need a little bit of breaking but it depends on the speaker how much audible difference there will nah, be or no 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 well what changes is the compliance, so how much the speaker is flexible. So every speaker will develop a warmer, rounder, fuller tone. It's not that it's losing treble, it's gaining on the mid-range and the bass. So the balance is shifting. Every speaker, every maker, every model. Uh, however, my advice is just to you know, give yourself some time play the speaker, let them, let them mature on their own. 20 hours, 30 hours at a decent volume, uh, you know, generic um, rehearsal volume with a the band, they will bring the speaker, say, 90% on his way. And I would absolutely recommend to stay away from uh, frequency generators, sweeps. Don't force the speaker too much. Even if you're doing this at low volume, you say, okay, I'm giving, I'm giving to the speaker five watts at a very, you know, with the sine waves. We, mm. How can I break a 100-watt speaker with that? Well, actually, you can, and for one reason. The speaker is built to respond to the guitar tone, and the guitar sound is made of transients. Even, even if you're doing you know, heavy metal, palm muting, hard rock riffing, it's always like peak and transient, peak and transient, and, and then even some milliseconds of silence. Mm -hmm. Those milliseconds are crucial for the voice coil to cool down and not to accumulate heat. Wow. So if you, do, if you give to the speaker a sweep tone 
even low volume, but you let him go for like two hours of continuous 40 hertz, the risk of damaging the voice coil is much, much, much higher than blasting a hundred watt of, of uh, you know, an, an eight string baritone guitar played with a hammer. Just play it, 20 hours, 30 hours. Perfect. And the follow-up question is, so uh, do speakers age? Is like... Do they sound different after 10 years or after five years or after one year or after 30 years? And do they age in a good or in a bad way? Okay. <laughs> and, and this is one of the reasons why it was so difficult when we were back engineering the stuff. Uh, speaker do age. Most of the aging happens in, let's say, the initial two, three months of use. When, when you have gone through your initial 30 hours and maybe you, you've broken the 100 hours or the 1,000 hours of use, the speaker is basically mature. And if it's not exposed to extreme abuse or extreme weather conditions, it will most likely stay very stable until, until it will be done, until it will be, his life cycle will be finished. However... Uh, climate conditions can be extremely impactant on 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 the uh, on this on the speaker age. I'll give you this example. Let's say in 1965, Fender produced the two deluxe reverbs, one next to the other. You know, subsequent serial numbers. One has been sold to a, a jazz guitar guy who played in his uh, living room in Denver, Colorado zero moisture and AC conditioning all year long. The next one went into a blues club in New Orleans where it has been beaten to death in the most damp, smoky, and dusty place that you can possibly imagine and the Katrina hurricane. Can I just say, I prefer the second guy. Just saying. Like, he's, I, I, like I, I had little doubt about that. <laughs> But the point is, you know, when, when that membrane has absorbed 30 years of smoke, dust, uh, humidity, you take these two speakers, you measure them, they will not sound the same. So which is the one that has been aged in, the, in a correct way? Which, which is the good one? You know, you actually don't know. There's no way you can tell. And, and that was our problem in the beginning. You know, we, we both probably... 15 or 20 C12 ends, which is the 12 inch of the deluxe reverb. And only by having so many and measuring them and comparing them, we kind of, yeah, found we the kind average. Of found which, in our opinion, is the, the right one to be cloned. But we decided to clone it. As if it was just out of the out of the factory. We didn't clone the aged tone because the aged tone is there's no consistency. So it's yeah. it's basically impossible to do. So I got it. Uh, okay, th this is this is the philosophical part in real terms. Yes, speaker age. They with, with today's technology, they age in a good way because today's glues and papers do not crystallize. With the vintage speakers, they they were using uh, an animal based like uh, hide glue. They yeah. they were using glues that with age they trying to dry out and crystallize. So they lose the little bit of elasticity. So when you if you push the speaker too hard. The membrane will detach from the basket, or worse, the, the voice coil will detach from the spider. So you got to mm. be extremely careful with vintage speakers. Okay. As you, you can use them, you push them a little bit, you listen carefully. If you start hearing rattling or anything that's not, that, that, that is suspicious, just stop and have the speaker inspected. Let me let me ask the mother of all questions, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, the most interesting th thing I want to know is what defines the sound of a speaker. I know there's the magnet. I know there are different materials for the magnet. I know there's the voice coil, and there are different sizes for the voice coil, and there's the paper, and then there's the dust cap. And but what makes the sound of a speaker? What defines a speaker the most, and how? 
I'm sure you can write a book about this, but yeah, I, I, again, I'll try to keep it short. And if I'm taking too long, you just you just shoot me. Uh, but uh, you know, it, 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 there's a little bit of voodoo. Uh, it's building a guitar speaker is completely different than building a bass speaker or a PA speaker because there you have a very clear target. You go for linearity. You go for yeah. less possible distortion, maximum possible efficiency. So it's kind, you know, there's a, there's a, there's, there are some rules in this book you can follow. A guitar speaker is not like that. A guitar speaker basically is always behaving non-linear. You know, even at very, very low volume, uh, it, it's, it's a wrong speaker if you look at it as a, from, from the hi-fi point of view. Yeah. So the membrane is designed to impart his own color to the tone, you know, the amount of corrugations, the amount of uh, treatment on the uh, suspension, um, the thickness of, of the membrane, all of this gives some coloration to the tone. The membrane, so I, I believe is, is, is candidate one to give the, the, the final tonal character. Can you say something like, if I make the membrane thicker, What's happening? Is it is it less if, high end or what, what's 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 it, changing? If you make a membrane thicker, it will have more bass, more linearity, less distortion, but also will be less efficient. So you will need to have a bigger voice coil and a much bigger magnet to have the same uh, efficiency. A lighter membrane will will have more mid high, uh, will have a lot more of distortion. Uh, and we'll need to be equally as loud a smaller voice coil and a smaller magnet. Interesting. So that means if I want to make a speaker a little darker, I can make the membrane a little thicker. Yeah. But I need I need more power to drive it, or I, yeah, I need a bigger magnet. Because otherwise, if you use a thicker membrane, or if you paint the membrane with with a heavy, uh, like a doping, that you know, speaker yeah. doping is one of the things that are most discussed. Everything you put on top of the speaker, including smoke, dust, or paint, gives more weight to the membrane. So decreases the sensitivity and decreases the trebles. Got it. So a membrane is number one. A voice coil diameter changes mostly in terms of power handling, but also gives a certain specific um, characteristic to the mid-range uh, Let's say all British speakers have a 44 millimeter voice coil, one and three quarters inch. That's the Celestion sound. Jensen usually uses a smaller voice coil, so it's a more trebly sound. Uh, apart from some of the newer ones, let's say the EVM 12L uh, mythological speaker, one of my favorite speakers overall, has a 2.5 inches, a, a five centimeter voice coil. It's huge. That's one of the reasons why it can handle up to 300 watts. But that will give the smoother uh, velvet kind of treble uh, tone. That's one of the reasons. But when, when we're talking about the mid-range, I guess, especially for high gain, the mid-range is where the tone lives. And oh, yeah. Even the, the the smallest changes will will do a lot, especially for us, chuga chuga heavy metal guitarists. And I remember that uh, when I was checking out some Jensen speakers, and I told you, "Hey, I like this one, and I like that one." You told me, "Ah, I I know why because they had the same voice coil size like the British speakers, or, or roughly the same one, right? No, exactly the same. Exactly the same, even. Yeah, the bigger it is, the more power it will handle, but the dimension will change mostly in the mid-range character. So if you if you are into the V30 kind of thing, you need to have a 1. Uh, 1.75 or 1 3 quarters inches or a 44 millimeters uh, voice coil because that, that, that's where the mid-range comes. And if I make it bigger, does the sound get more scooped? Because that's uh, no. the impression I have from the from uh, the Celestian speakers that have a bigger voice coil. They always sound a little more scooped, or is that just a? That's a combination of things. the the the, the, the most the, the most immediate effect you will hear you will have a softer tone starting from three k and above. 
Okay. What, what I hear, what I have measured, you know, by changing voice cords. And then there is the magnet. Uh, magnet, the smaller the magnet, the looser the base, and the smaller the, uh, it will be less firm, it will be less strong. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, will, it will take some time to push the membrane, and it will need more time to stop it. So if, if you need a very tight tone, you need a, you need a very powerful magnet. That's, that's, that, that, that's for sure. So, so the more precise you want your low end, your base to be, the bigger... The bigger the, the magnet should be, okay. yes. And, and what about, that is also very interesting, what about material? You know, we all know there are these neodymium speakers, lightweight uh, magnets, lightweight magnets. Many people don't like them, but how does the, the material affect the sound? It's a magnet, I mean... Uh, well, you know... Even the pickups in your guitar have ceramic or alnico magnets, and, and it's a magnet, but it actually changes the sound. Le let's try to make it very focused. Uh, the first material used was alnico because that was that was available at the time. Uh, alnico has the tendency of slowly compressing the mo the louder you push the speaker. It's a very subtle musical compression. And the impedance curve grows in, in, uh, in, in a certain way with, with the increasing of the frequency. So it, it imparts a different chimey kind of tone to the mid-high and trebles. Mm -hmm. So that's more or less what Alnico does. When Alnico went just too expensive for the industry in the, mid, in, in the early 60s, Everybody switch it to ceramic because it's like three times the weight, but one third of the price at the same strength. So uh, ceramic is tighter, is um, it gives you a more precise kind of response, uh, and it does not compress up to the point. I mean, when when, when if you hear dynamic compression with a ceramic speaker you know you went too far you know you are already basically burning the speaker because otherwise a ceramic speaker very rarely uh, gets to the point of compressing uh, neodymium sits somewhere in between neodymium behaves much more like an alnico than a ceramic so it's um, it's somewhere in between We actually like it a lot uh, because we have learned on our own experience how to how to voice the speaker to sound good with uh, uh, an alnico. And well, the first generation of neodymium speakers was simply not good enough because we all, we Celestion, whoever else, took a ceramic speaker, rip, pulled off the the the, the magnet, and stick in a magnet of the same strength, expecting it would have sound the same, and it, it didn't. No. Yeah. So okay. we, we needed to completely revoice the, the, the membrane to adapt the speaker to the, neo, to, the, to the Neo. And doing this, we realized that it actually behaves like an alnico. It sounds like an alnico. So we voiced the speaker as if the, the magnet was an alnico. This was our way Now, if you take our speakers and you and you listen to them, basically there is no difference between an alnico and a neo, or an alnico uh, or a neo and, and, and the ceramic. But you, what you, I take you, away is there's like always it's always the whole system that matters, right? Yeah. It's so always what you said is you, you you can't just remove the magnet and replace it with another material that will just destroy the whole. It will concept. be imbalanced. It, it will be unbalanced. Yeah. So so how do you? Uh, that was also a question by someone called Thrashing Bass Kill. That's a lovely name, by the way. Thrashing Bass Kill. Uh, he's asking, how do you voice speakers? So, um, so if you design a new speaker for high gain or for whatever you want, how do you? What's your approach there? I mean, you need to find a system out of all those components, right? How do you do that? Well, you know, we have learned a little bit. So we have, if somebody, if a customer asks us, uh, a high, let's say, a speaker for hard rock 
uh, heavy metal or whatever, you know, for a certain, we know from our experience and by the, the hundred of speakers we have measured from the competition, we know that every 30 has a certain kind of characteristics. We know where, where, where the, the peaks are, we know where the valleys are in the frequency response, we know where the speaker starts to um, generate harmonics, and all, all these kind of things. So we have our own idea of where we need to go. And so we, we choose a specific voice coil size, we choose if wiring the voice coil in copper or aluminium, that changes the tone. Okay. Uh, we choose the the diameter of the dust cap. Not only the material, also the size. The, the larger the dust cap is, giving the same material, the earlier the speaker will start rolling off trebles. You need to balance all of these things. And you develop, this is a prototype, develop it for a customer, by the way. I can tell it's a prototype because it's, it's not painted black. We keep all prototypes you know, in order to be absolutely certain we are not messing up. But, you know, <laughs> we, we exactly knew what this guy wanted, and and uh, we do one, two, three, four, six, no, no matter how many. I think we I think we are way above 6,000 prototypes since the beginning of Jensen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, you talked about harmonics and you talked about compression. So yeah. that's what's happening when you, when you drive a speaker. Yeah. Uh, that's another question uh, uh i mean i think back in the days people love to drive the speakers hard i don't know why i have made the the opposite experience that for the like tighter modern metal tones that i'm looking for and for a tight bass especially if you drive the speakers too hard it just sounds kind of farty and loose and not good so i figured that's something that was cool for Jimi hendrix but it's not cool for me but what do you think here? Like, what, what happens when you drive a speaker harder? Okay. If you start from bedroom level, everybody complains that bedroom level sounds horrible. And it's mostly true. Uh, because the amp doesn't breathe, the tube doesn't, the, the tube do not cook, uh, and basically the speaker doesn't move. So it's not, it's not pushing air. There's no way you can get around uh, with that. If the speaker doesn't doesn't move some air, you won't get the same feeling. Uh, yeah. Whatever happens between the bedroom level and let's say a, a average loud but reasonable uh, level, it's just more air moving. But the speaker will not really change its behavior until you know un until you're actually blowing it. But, you know, your perception is different. The Fletcher-Manson curve of your ears will be different. Uh, the amp will cook in a different way. The guitar will feed back to the amp and will interact with the amp in a different way. So it's not just a speaker that's been, that sounds better when pushed. It is is rock and roll that needs to <laughs> be played at a certain volume. It's as simple as that. I'm in a studio here, so I can even, I can listen to the sound of a speaker through a microphone without the excitement of loudness or without being fooled by the loudness. But it's still difficult to tell because if you're pushing a tube amp, you're both pushing the speaker and pushing the tube amp. So for me, it's hard to tell where the change yeah. in sound is coming from. I just may have the experience that if I push it too hard, um, it just sounds kind of yeah, loose and farty in the low end. It, you know, it, I just don't like it. And uh, it feels like the speaker is like crapping out or something. But you just uh, said there's no difference? or it, There's no difference until they are really bottoming out, until the excursion is so wide that they are basically hitting the bottom of the voice coil or nearly being stripped off the basket. So that's okay. when you hear the speaker. Everything else is the amp that's you know is coming to the point. It's, Interesting. So it's 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 once again it's the system. It's the combination of everything. That is that is a very important thing because that's a real myth. I mean that's what everybody keeps on telling me uh, on YouTube and comments and elsewhere and forums is like you need to push the speakers harder so they sound better. They need to, you know they need to move. It's the system and it's your perception. Let, let me tell you this very quickly. There are some thousand tracks 
that are regarded as some of the best sounding tracks ever recorded that have been recorded with the Fender Deluxe Reverb 22 watts with an Electro Voice EVM 12L or a JBL E120 which are like 300 watt speakers or 200 watt speakers so how far could, could those yeah. amps push those speakers but you know all the american pop rock of, of the 70s and the 80s rivera mesa boogie victoria steely dan larry carlton robin ford doobie brothers santana they were using speakers that were like four or five times the power output of, of the amp that we, makes sense that makes total sense i mean i'm happy that we finally found one one myth that we could <laughs> right i got a question from vasilis koskinas i guess right. from greece can you ignacio tell us uh, if you know any secret treasure speakers from metal that are not very famous but they still deliver here's your <laughs> chance <laughs> well uh, there is that that's my chance it's also your chance because we we have discussed this a little bit and we try to work out together a, a few a few speakers that may uh, you know may appeal to, uh, to the non-traditional Jensen player. L let's be honest: the traditional Jensen player is a clean, push it clean, crunchy, classic rock kind of guy. But you know, when metal exploded, we were not in the business, so none of our classic speakers were was designed for a closed back 4x12 large size cab with high gain uh, amp pushing it. So it's kind of natural. So we, we entered in this business later uh, with our own little recipes and you have a few of them. What, what do you think? What you have tried? That the, uh, what, what did you find interesting? Well, uh, I have just quickly tried them, but you know, my my job is to show people on YouTube and elsewhere some alternatives because I feel as much as I love the Vintage 30, especially with the one in Mesa Boogie cabinets, um, as, as much as I love it, it has really become boring because everybody's using the same thing. Everybody's getting used to the same sound. I'm not talking about like changing everything, but I'm talking about looking for alternatives. So that's how I started. And that's how I started doing those speaker videos. So I looked especially at Eminence and at Jensen. And uh, I have to say, I found a lot of cool speakers nobody's talking about. I think it started with the Tornado Stealth 65 from Jensen, yep. which is uh, a neodym speaker. Yep. And uh, and I have done a video about that one, and a lot of people bought it after that and got back to me, and they were so happy about that sound because it is quite unusual. It's hard to describe. It sounds a little more woody and darker somehow than a Vintage 30. It's an interesting speaker that really gives you a different voice that is actually quite far away from a v30 yeah now i have been testing um three speakers uh one was the nighthawk which sounds I, i've just done some quick tests but which seems to sound really cool and seems to be a little scooped in the lower mid-range which mm -hmm. makes it sit really nice in the in a mix but it's not the most vocal and full sounding speaker in the no. mid-range I've tested the electric lightning, which seemed to sound darker, but if you mic it the right way, it was also interesting. And uh, I also have the Raptor, but I haven't really checked that one out, just quickly. But I can already tell you that that combination of Nighthawk and electric lightning sounded really good. I used it in one of my videos. And uh, I have been working, this week I have been working with a pretty famous death metal band that I I, I'm not allowed to talk about. I'm mixing their album right now. And we've actually used those two speaker on that album. Oh, that's cool. So, so I can tell uh, they are actually very usable. And I will do a video soon about... I think you even sent me a fourth speaker. I can't remember now. And uh, so I, for those people out there who are looking for alternatives that are not totally far away from a V30 sound, but something else, those Jensen speakers will be very... Interesting. And I'm not getting paid for this or anything. I'm just saying this because I like those speakers and I like... And that's awesome. Checking out uh, different tones. Which was the first... Do you remember? Which was the f the fourth speaker you sent me? It's, I think it's called C12 as well. C12, but then there's uh, N2... C12 K2. K2. That's the K2. one. K2. 
So that's a perfect example. The, the, the C12K2 is a, a wonderful speaker, uh, and it's very similar to the Raptor. The only difference, technically, between the K2 and the Raptor is, is just a slight difference in the voicing of the membrane and, and a difference in, in the dust cap. Mm -hmm. That changes completely the character of the speaker with just a, 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 a minor adjustment that in terms of value in manufacturing cost is nothing. But they appeal to completely different players. So it's uh, wow. voodoo. <laughs> yeah, but that will be interesting. So I, I promise I will do a video that will be called something like Can Jensen Do Metal? You know, mm -hmm. so a fancy YouTube title. And... Uh, so I will compare those four speakers, and it will Amazing. be especially interesting to compare the Raptor and the what was it C twelve C twelve K two K two, that one knowing that only those little parts have been changed and nothing else. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people will love this because I can I already know they sound cool. You know, another question that just c comes to mind, at least about vintage 30s, I can say, if I get a new 4x12 cab that I have not recorded before, the first thing I do is I will check out every single speaker because if you close mic them, they will sound very different. And so you have to find the good one, so to say. Um, so there's a large tolerance there. You're not gonna hear that in the room when you hear like the... When, when you, because, you hear, because you're hearing four of them. Right, you're hearing the mix of four speakers, you're hearing reflections, so you cannot tell one speaker from the other. But if you mic them, there is a difference. So is this a Celestian thing, or do all speakers have that tolerance, and why? There is a tolerance, and 80 per or 90% of the variations uh, come from the membrane. Because, let, I mean, let's face it, it's basically melted paper, printed and pressed. Mm -hmm. it's very hard for the membrane manufacturer to control this to the point where you have a thousand membranes and they all sound exactly the same. It's, it's on the edge of being impossible. It's like okay. dealing with wood, you know? You, mm -hmm. you yeah. have 10 identical guitars, you, you, you play them acoustically and they all sound different because it's wood and cellulose is basically wood. So yes, there is a tolerance. When we manufacture a run of speakers, we can set our tolerance between, because we measure each and every one of them, of course. And we can set the tolerance plus minus zero, plus minus 0 0.5, plus minus one dB, two dB, six dBs. It really depends, you know, it depends on what the requirement is. It depends on what you want to do. I mean, right now, when I look at the market, like 10, 10 or 15 years ago, everybody was playing, in metal, everybody was playing 4x12 cabs by mostly Marshall and Mesa Boogie, and then there were others, Engel, Randall, you name it. And these days, um, people are mostly buying 2x12 cabs for whatever reason, and people are going custom. And I really like that. Uh, they are buying cabs from companies like Scylla or Hezu or something where you can determine which speakers you want to have and they combine speakers. And I see a lot of the people watching this show here, watching my YouTube channel, are really interested in, 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 in finding their custom personal combination of speakers and finding their tone. So that is, a, that is something that I, that I want to support, you know? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, one small word of warning. Do not mix different impedance speakers in the same cab. Even if the overall impedance falls into the range that your amp can live with, but the lower impedance one will always suck a lot more of energy from the output stage. So it will always sound louder than the other, regardless of the sensitivity. Oh, that's... Uh, stay with the same impedance. Number two, try to use speakers with a matchable sensitivity or, 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 or efficiency because, you know, a speaker that's like 96 dBs one, with one watt and a speaker that has maybe 99 dBs one watt is actually the double in terms of mm. electric, in electric terms. So you will 
that one will always seem to overpower and overshadow the other. So yes, you can mix, especially in studio, I think is a, is a very interesting experience. Yeah. And I'm a studio guy, so I, I love it. Right now I have, I think I have five 4x12 cabs, and I think only two of them are have the same speakers. All the others have combinations, but that, of course, with the same impedance, of course, yeah. but it, I'm, I'm close miking them and I'm mixing them together again in the studio. So let's move on. Uh, this is a question by Jonas Jönsson, Swedish or Norwegian. Uh, how come that we don't see more odd numbers when it comes to the size of the speaker element? I know that 15 inch is a pretty common size in bass cabinets, but I wonder why is there no 11 inch or 13 inch speaker? And follow up question, why are all guitar speakers 12 inch, 12 inch if you want to distort and maybe 10 inch if you want to play clean? Why has there never been someone trying a whatever, 13 or 15 inch speaker for guitars. Is it just because we're used to it? Uh, no, it's because unfortunately we need standards. And for economy scale, for mass production. But I mean, but I mean you, you are making, but you are making 15 inch speakers, right? For bass cabinets, for PA yeah. systems, but you're not making a 15 inch guitar speaker. No, we are doing. Well, the, you're doing the, guitar speakers. Oh yeah. We, we oh. make six, eight, 10, 12, and 15. Wow. So yeah, we, we make all sizes. Uh, why don't we make a 13? Let me just answer though. So shut up, Jonas Jönsson. It's not true. <laughs> no, well, okay. but you know, he, he was mentioning like 11 or 13 inches yeah. or nine inches. That's just because it's not a standard. You know, no, no industrial customer will accept because they will need to rethink all of the designing of the cabs and, and to adapt it. Yeah, yeah, right, Standards right. are a pain in the ass, but sometimes, yeah. you know, you, you just cannot do they help. everything. Yeah. It doesn't make sense on yeah, a technical right. point of view. Your, your other question, because we are used to it, 12 inch is the guitar size. Uh, because we, we, we because we became used to it, because our ear became used to it, and because our designer fine-tuned the response of the amplifier for the 12 inch. It is a brilliant compromise uh, and has kind of the best of best of everything. Uh, it, it, good size, good power handling, not too heavy. Uh, I mean there's very little reason to change. So okay. for a traditional amp, a 12 inch is just Beautiful. All right, so we have learned a lot about speakers. I think I have to watch this again to fully understand everything uh, you have told me. And uh, I will go check out those Jensen speakers again and make a nice video for all of you who want to be different, you know, because uh, they sound very promising. I mean, I have just used them on a record, so that, that means... I really that means a lot. I really like them. Yeah. And that means a lot. And I and I'm also I have just used them in a oversized Marshall cab that I just bought, which sounds really good, but I'm really looking forward to put it into my uh, Mesa Boogie cabs because they are my my standard. Not only my standard, like the international heavy metal standard. Uh the only thing I don't like about the Jensen speakers is that they all look the same. I think I even called you. They, you look at the backside, and they all—they there's not even the name on them. I thought like that's so confusing. Uh, Why? It, 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 you know, when when we started, we 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 faced the same the same problem. Uh, it since the very beginning, the only way to 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 tell a speaker out of, out out of the other was looking at the uh, white ink print on, on on the edge of the on the edge of the um, the frame. Wow. And so the, the vintage ratio had to be that, had to be of like course. that. Of course, of course. And maybe it wasn't the most wise idea for the new design to keep the same philosophy. So the same label goes on every everything, and the only detail that is the white ink print on on the on the basket. Maybe it's our fault. Maybe there's something that can be corrected. Uh, I, I I guarantee you, they do not sound all the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, I know that. No, they, I, know they to, they, I, I think it was the electric lightning and the Nighthawk. And I was like, I still knew I had taken this one out of this 
package and because I really got like, oh damn, now I have to put some paper on because I couldn't I couldn't tell them apart. They look exactly the same. Yeah. So be careful if you buy those speakers. Those Italian guys are weird in that regard. Whatever. <laughs> like, Ignacio, it was a pleasure talking to you. It was so nice. And I will make a follow-up video showing the speakers. And I hope we can meet here again and talk about speakers more. I hope that you guys out there enjoyed this a lot. And I want you to ask more questions in the comments. And I want you to yeah make a lot of comments. And uh, I think both me and Ignacio will be uh trying to to answer yeah, those sure. questions so the more discussion we have about speakers the better it is um uh, what else i will put some links to some jensen speakers down there i will put a link to the to my email list because you know you could send me those questions if you want to be on my email list um uh yeah uh, sell me your soul check the link below once again thanks for being on this channel thanks Thank for taking you the time for having me and uh, yeah, I see you all in hell, motherfuckers. Good night. Ciao.